Test, test. Oh, it's working. Nice. Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm Richard on the internet. I'm Gina. And I would like to show you how I automated my home, basically. And I did it with a software which is called Home Assistant. So let's get started. So let me first talk about the alternatives, which you most of you know, like there's Google Home and Apple HomePod and the Amazon Echo. They are very convenient uh, because uh, it's it's done for for the consumers, so you don't need to 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 do everything yourself, setting up, finding the right. Uh, software and hardware and so on. Everything connects automatically and so on. But oh, of course everything is happening in the cloud uh, on them, so you speak to it and it sends everything to home and then hopefully you get something back because they are nice looking bricks if the internet goes down. So if, if something happens with the internet you can't use your home automation. Uh, yeah, so the problem I have with them, the biggest problem is obviously the sending back, uh, phoning back home, but also they have not really an incentive to integrate with other brands' hardware. So it's always you, you need to, to basically take what they offer you and then just go with it and just give them more money, basically. Uh, there are nice alternatives which are not uh, not usable with them. Uh, so, what is Home Assistant? It's uh, a central software which you run on, on, on a device at your home. It doesn't need to be internet connected, but it can. It listens for events uh, uh, which are happening on, on, on different hardware. And then it triggers automations which you which you prepare basically or programmed you call it, you could call it programming almost. And also it logs everything what is happening so you can go back in time and and, and make graphs or whatever. So the the front end is written in in a JavaScript library called Polymer, and it uses web components, which are quite a new thing. Uh, they they kind of use the Google Material Design guidelines to to make it. And the really nice thing about Home Assistant is that it's written in the backend is written in Python, so you can run it basically on on whatever hardware you want, which just needs to support Python, which is like from a from an old Raspberry Pi up to a dead server somewhere in uh, uh, in Germany <laughs> or whatever. It has uh, over one thousand integrations with with different hardware and software uh, uh, around, uh, and it has a really really big community. Yeah, I will come back to most of the points later. Yeah. So, but let's look at the UI. So that's my... Uh, when, when I open Home Assistant at home, or basically in a browser, I see this, <coughs> uh, which uh, has like this sidebar with, with more like deeper for the logbook, for developer tools and stuff. And then and at the center, there is all the way up the sensors. Uh, you can see that my kitchen sensor doesn't work. The kitchen temperature sensor doesn't work. And you can see the kitchen temperature history is also <laughs> broken. I, when I was fiddling with, with, it, with the sensor, I broke it like a week ago and didn't really have time to fix it. But more on that later also. Then I have like uh, still up Christmas lights because they are nice to have. <laughs> uh, I have some power switches. I have a CCTV cam. Uh, then, then we, uh, oh yeah, and lights and a camera also. Uh, the camera shows up there if it's on, but most of the time when I'm home, it's not. Okay, uh, 
So if you would like to test it or like install it, there, there is a nice uh, side project of Home Assistant, which uh, is called Has.io, which is an image which you just flash on your Raspberry Pi. And they, they have like basically an app store with extensions, which are all implemented as Docker images. Which is nice because then if some some extension goes wild, then it doesn't doesn't break everything. It just breaks the one thing, which because of the containment. <coughs> it has automatic updates, which is also realized with those uh, Docker images, which is super nice. But obviously, once once you go that route, it's much more difficult to to tinker with the software yourself. Because everything is hidden in in containers, and you need to understand the whole stack of Docker to, to get around. So the the idea for Hasio is basically to to make it easier for normal people uh, to to start with it, and they because Home Assistant has a lot of uh, uh, UI for programming automations and looking at, at data and so on. So you don't don't need that much uh, like knowledge about deep uh, sysadmin stuff just to just to run it or to configure it. Uh, so let's look at my really small hardware setup. So uh, you've seen the the UI and it's I do have. Uh, uh, let's start on the left. So, so I have it right now running on a Raspberry Pi, which is connected to the Ethernet cable, and it's connected to a, a soundboard, which is there, <laughs> and it's connected to to a testing duo, which is uh, discontinued. So Teldus doesn't uh, doesn't sell it anymore. Uh, because they came up with a new version which is connected to the internet. This one is just plain USB to 433 MHz and it's, uh, it doesn't speak, it doesn't phone home or anything. And they sold it for half price, like for half a year, so a lot of people got it <laughs> just for that. Then I have uh, so the Telstick uh, is talking uh, to the Nexus switches, which many of you might know. I had those Nexus switches already before before I started with uh, before I started with with the tel with automation, because I wanted to switch off everything at my desk or everything by my TV with one button when I go out and switch on everything by one button and not going around and pressing all the buttons just to save energy then uh, the light bulb I bought Wi-Fi enabled ones which, uh, w which have an uh, open protocol so it's already integrated in, uh, in uh, Home Assistant uh, for it's called Yi Light. It's some Chinese company, but it's nice of them to to, to offer an open protocol, so everybody can talk to the light bulbs uh, if they want to. Basically, they need to be obviously on the same Wi-Fi because yeah, for obvious reasons. And then uh, what do we have more? Uh, I have a main button which I use to change state <laughs> of my flat, basically. So I want to change state uh, for if I'm asleep or not, basically. Then uh, the thermometer here is also homemade, uh, as you can see. And then the Christmas light, and uh, then I use the switches for, for for like the like Christmas lights and the TV and stuff like this, just to save energy. 
and I use for 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 detection if I'm at home or not. I use my phone. So, so let's see about a little bit about the software setup. Uh, so I run it on uh, Raspbian OS because I didn't want to use HasIO because I want to have more control over the software. So I just ran normal Raspbian OS and then I installed uh, Home Assistant on it, which uh, which which you just install with uh, with a normal Python uh, thingy pip install has. And then uh, the 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 light are those bulbs which have uh, this protocol. Then uh, Tendus has also a driver and some uh, some utilities for the for the command line, which are all written in C which is nice because then you can compile it for Windows, Mac, or Linux. Uh, so those are used for to talk to the uh, Telstick Duo. Uh, USB dongle basically, which then talks to everything else, the, the Nexus switches basically. And then uh, the rest of the, the software, which are small parts, I've myself written with, with help of the Arduino IDE, uh, because I use, uh, that's mostly software for, for the small ESP8622 chips, those wi small Wi-Fi chips. Okay, so just a couple of steps how I set it up. Basically, install. Oh, there is also a, a special version of Raspbian which is called Haspbian, which has already, um, which is Raspbian but with Home Assistant pre installed and pre configured. So you just boot it up, wait for five minutes, and, and it's, uh, it does everything for you. and then, the UI just shows up, basically. Then I myself uh, did compile and install the Teldus Core software, which talks to the Teldus stick, because the, the, the package which I found just, just didn't work. <laughs> so I had to install it myself, uh, compile it myself, and that worked uh, quite well. Uh, then for the te presence detection, I use my phone and see if uh, if if uh, so so on, on the Raspberry Pi, I have the Raspberry Pi three, so it does have uh, Bluetooth, and therefore I can look for for my phone if the phone is close by or not, and that's quite nice. If I just, I have a fairly small flat. So, so when I when I come from from somewhere with my bicycle, I see that everything in my flat is uh, there's there are lights, and then I'm coming closer and closer, and then like perhaps twenty meters from the flat, everything lights up and welcomes me basically. <laughs> so which is nice. But yeah, so install and configure blues on on the Raspberry Pi. And then uh, I configured the Home Assistant for, for the hardware I have. And that's obviously uh, not a one-time thing because you always want to, to add one more stuff, thing to it. So you, you work all the time with the configuration and make it better and so on. Then I wrote some uh, simple uh, automations. Uh, like like uh, a clock in the morning. So in the morning at 6... When I'm supposed to wake up, the light in, in my in my sleeping room goes goes on to to wake me up basically. And then I built those uh, the the Wi-Fi thermometer and the button with time. And then yeah, then I configured them obviously to be useful in the home assistant itself. So let's talk about presence detection. So in Home Assistant, there are, uh, 
the, the, for me, the most important thing is that it knows that I'm at home or I'm not at home. Because depending on if I'm at home or if I'm coming home or I'm going away, I want to run different automations. For example, uh, when I leave home, I want, uh, I want it to, to switch off everything like my everything on my desk because I don't need it so why, sh why should it be on and before that I just I went everywhere and pressed the button and now I don't need to do it anymore and I, I'm still not quite there yet, uh, where I uh, switch off everything because the uh, in, uh, like microwave might be a thing which I want to switch off everything which basically takes energy uh, or, or an iron or something like that. It would be nice to, to have a peace of mind that, okay, if, if I forgot the iron, I can still go into my phone and switch it off. Or it switches it off automatically when I leave home, so nothing will happen. But uh, there is more to presence detection, because you can do it uh, with different technologies. <coughs> So I'm using Bluetooth, low energy, to, to see if I'm home or not. But you could also uh, use your Wi-Fi router, because if once you come home, your phone normally connects to your Wi-Fi, and then, uh, that, then that can be detected, and then that can be used as a, uh, as a presence detection. There are also many, many more which are uh, on a bigger scale, which use GPS. I used OnTrex for a while, which in theory is super cool because then you, you, it's still, it, it OnTrex is like an app on your phone, which, uh, which, which looks at the location and it just sends your location via HTTP to your home assistant or, or either HTTP or MQTT basically. So it's if you use HTTPS on your on your home assistant, then it's secure, and only you on, it's on, only on your devices basically, which which uh, the information is shared on. Uh, but my problem was that it didn't quite detect that I came home or went away. It always lagged a lot, and then sometimes it just showed that I'm like. 200 meters away from my flat when I wasn't, so it wasn't that useful for me at least. Uh, and then Google Maps uh, does basically the same, but instead of, uh, you know, in Google Maps you can share your, lo your current location, either for, for one hour, five hours or indefinitely. So what, you, what, what people came up with is you just create another Google uh, Conto and then you just share it with this one and this one uh, then gets integrated into Home Assistant and then you can always see. The nice thing with this is that Google doesn't, uh, doesn't do it like home tricks where it just starts up the application, looks for the GPS signal and then sends you the, the whole uh, information and then shuts down, but Google because they, they do the whole Android thing, obviously they can manage it to, to, to bundle, uh, bundle applications which want to know where, where you are together and just make it like once for, like just call once and then give the information to everyone, which, is, uh, which preserves your battery much better on your phone at least. So, also, if you know where people are, then you could do something like if you if you have for children, for example, you want to know that they arrived at school or that they arrived at home, then you can make zones like a radius thingy on your map, and then you 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 could either do automation if someone goes into the home zone or the school zone or whatever, or you can also obviously just send yourself a, a message, a push, push notification or something like that. So that's, that's interesting if, you're, if you have more people 
Uh, yeah. Okay, let's go to the next one, which is like the, the easiest use case to come up with for home automation. So everybody, in, I myself had, was like this also in the beginning. So yeah, I like the idea, home automation, woo! But what will I automate? I don't know. The only thing I came up with is, is the lights. So, but it's kind of weird that you you need to take your, out your phone and then switch on and off the light. But you could just use the the, the light switch. It's much easier and much more uh, natural to use. But uh, it doesn't matter. I still did it. <laughs> And so this is how, how basically I set it up. Um, yeah, so it's the easiest to set up because you, you buy like a Wi-Fi bulb and and then put it in. And then you just connect it to, to they most often have like an app where you can put in the, your Wi-Fi password and stuff like this. And then uh, they are connected and then they are on the Wi-Fi with, with their own IP. So you can send messages to them and ask them for for the status and stuff like this. Uh, it's fairly uh, expensive to replace all the lights, obviously. In my flat I have like six lights, which I replaced. And every light bulb costs between 200 and uh, 600 kroners. So and especially if you want to do it user-friendly then you normally don't, don't want to just replace the bulb but instead you want to replace the switch so that it doesn't matter if you use the switch or the bulb because right now, like I have it now because I don't, don't live in my own house, I live in a flat I don't want to tinker with, with everything so I did the bulbs but with the switch would be nice because then you could either use the app or some automation or everyone else could still use the normal switches. Right now I have it I have to leave everything on so so the electricity goes to the light bulb because obviously if I switch switch the switch off, no electricity, it can't switch it itself on. So it's, it's a big problem when I have uh, parties because people come in and just switch the light on or off and everything is fucked. But I try to, to explain why and so on. Uh, it's a cool thing to, to basically show off your automation because you can, do, you, can, you can program the lights to blink or in different colors. Uh, so Home Assistant has like some some pre-programmed uh, programs where you when you can can make your lights look like the police is coming or it has the Facebook color or if if some message comes on Facebook or something like that. So it's cool on, in a party when you do the music thing and everybody's dancing and then you can have different colors like in a discotheque. So it's. Uh, Everybody is just amazed, even if it's like a, a, a thing to. Uh, you can in Home Assistant you can group everything into groups. So so I grouped uh, a couple of my lights so so some so I can switch them on and off and uh, differently. Uh, yeah, as I said before, I looked a long time for for light bulbs which offer an open protocol so I can myself either program some program them or just find something which 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 can connect to them. As I said in the beginning the, the other ones they don't want to uh, don't want to connect to others and let let others uh, automate themselves and so on. So it's a bit of a hassle in my opinion, to find the right thing to, to, to be able to do what you want to do. Uh, yeah, so, so, uh, so, yeah, exactly problematic with the switches. <laughs> uh, so more on wireless technologies. Uh, so obviously we've, we've seen Bluetooth 
and Wi-Fi, which everybody knows. <coughs> but we also have uh, the low power device, uh, 433 megahertz, uh, what do you call it, yeah, technology basically, which is a, a UHF band, uh, which is uh, in, in which license, uh, so, so communication device don't need to get a license to use it. And it was used uh, for CB, uh, so citizen band radio basically, uh, or is still used, because everybody can just use this band to, to do whatever they want. But uh, it it has no, no common protocol, so everybody just makes their own protocol, so you need uh, to see. So the Nexus switches, for example, have an open protocol, and many people have those Nexus switches already at home, so it's a nice first step for automation. Uh, yeah, uh, so then we have ZigBee, which is an open protocol. It's on a much higher, it's on some kilohertz, uh, gigahertz, I don't remember exactly where. Uh, it's defined by the ZigBee Alliance, uh, so, which, is, which is nice because as an open protocol, they, uh, everybody can implement it if they want to. Uh, and then it, uh, it, uh, it creates a mesh network, so, which means that even uh, if something is far away, you, you, you can uh, uh, get the information by going through the edges, basically. So you can you can you can go from from your kitchen to your living room, and there from there to, to the sleeping room, for example. Even if the sleeping room would be too far away for something like the low power device thingy. So, which is really cool if you have like a, a, a house or like something bigger in a flat, it mostly will work with, with the low power devices. But everything a little bigger, it's nice to have a mesh network without setting up everything for itself and combining everything, it just does it automatically. And uh, the most the, the, the Philips Hue, which most of you probably know, this, those Philips uh, light bulbs, they use it also. Uh, then there's uh, Z-Wave. It's a closed protocol. Uh, you, can, you can read it if you're a customer to them, but it's a much, much easier to implement protocol than the Zigbee. Uh, because Digby has like profiles and yeah, it's, it's more complicated. Uh, it also in, uh, ha has this mesh network uh, uh, technology where the same as Digby basically. Yeah, so, but I'm, I myself, I'm still a beginner in this whole automation thingy, so I'm still on the low power device side, uh, but I guess, if I would guess, then I would go for Zigbee as a next step, just because it's a open protocol and I like that. So I told you already that I, I'm I started by just switching off everything when I go from home and switching it off again, so my TV I have like my music amps in different rooms where I play music. I, I switch off the, uh, the Wi-Fi access point because if I'm not at home then it doesn't need to, to work. Obviously the computer and the screen and my Christmas light and I even switch off the Ethernet switches because I don't need them when I'm not at home. Everything is basically put into one, uh, what do you call it? like this here and then I switch off the whole thing and then everything is down basically. In the future 
I want, might want to add the kitchen stove to it because mostly for, for peace of mind. So it happened to me one time that that I went for a run and I had my my food on the on the stove. I went for a run. I lost my keys and it was a Sunday Sunday evening. So I tried to call the the guys who can open your door but nobody was there and I was really afraid that, that it would start a fire so I had to throw a stone into, <laughs> into a window just to come in into the flat. With something like that I could just switch it off from the outside which would be nice. Uh, as I said the iron is exactly the same problem. You, you go away from your flat, perhaps you go you just iron some, something and go for a long uh, journey and then you can just look, oh, okay, it's still on or no, okay, it's off, or you can switch it on off. And the microwave and stuff like this. So those here you can see the next switch is nicely, which is basically you take it and put it just it into the jack. And, and it's, it has a uh, I relay in it so you can hear it click, click, if, like, like in your car basically. <coughs> so, automations, which are the heart of, uh, of the system. I don't have very many, but they are really fun to, to have basically. I told you already about my alarm clock, which just switches on the light in the morning to, to wake me up. I have a good morning uh, automation where I, where I trigger. Uh, so normally, yeah, it's a bit complicated, but the sleeping toggle is one automation which then automates uh, either Good morning or good night, but I can I can trigger it from different directions. I will talk about this later. But basically, the good morning automation just switches on the lights and and everything which I need during the, the day. The good night one is switches off the lights obviously and the TV and the computer and everything. So Gina coming home is basically like I told you before. Everything goes on, but uh, yeah, it's it's not very different to to the good morning, but it's a different trigger basically to it. And then the train alarm, which tells me that the train is going soon, so I should leave. So let's see. Uh, let's look at the UI. So there are like three steps to it. A trigger, then let me see, uh, then the, a condition, and then an action. So let, let's just see on the trig, uh, uh, see the trigger and the action. So this is a screenshot from uh, from my automation when I'm, Gina is coming home. So the trigger is the state of the entity device tracker Galaxy S8, which is my phone, uh, changes from home to not home, if that happens, then I do those three actions. The first one is it call the service uh, home automation turn off on the entity ID group power switches. So I turn off all the power switches. Then the second one is call service uh, also, but instead of uh, home assistant, for the entity, I, I take the, the group lights and turn them all off. And then the th third is take the switch with the identity ID switch CCTV cam and switch it on. So just to just when I'm gone, then, then it's on. So you can you can also have conditions. Here I have a condition, uh, oh, three conditions, which is for my automation for, for the, that the train is leaving. So, so it gets triggered by a timer, 
uh, and then the time, the conditions for the timer. So, uh, so after the timer has triggered, those three conditions needs to be met. So the, the device Galaxy S8, that's on my home, should be in the state home. Then uh, the state of the inf input boolean, it's just called like that because it's it's yeah it's some internal stuff in in home assistant when it, where you can set like uh, uh, inputs. And uh, I have one which is called sleeping, which I put on to on and off. So if I'm sleeping, then it's on. Otherwise, it's off. So I, I need to be at home. I need to not be still sleeping, and it needs to be between uh, so after six o'clock and before eleven o'clock. And only if all those are met, then we call the service, which is uh, Pico text to speech, and we let it say, "Gina, the train goes in seven minutes. If you don't go now, you'll be late." So I hear it, and then I remember, oh shit, yeah, I need to go now. Uh, configuration. Uh, so many things are possible in the UI, but everything else uh, needs to be done in, in, a YAM, in YAML, YAML config files. And normal hardware configuration as always in Linux, like in ETC or somewhere else. So I have an uh, example configuration here, so uh, in, in YAML format on the right, so that there's the device tracker, which, is, which defines a platform, which is a Bluetooth tracker, which is just uh, a type of, of a tracker, and it should not track new devices, because I only want to look at mine. But if you are uh, trying to get new devices in, then you would put it on own and then it will find it automatically and so on. <laughs> then I have, I uh, want to connect my home assistant to an MQTT broker, uh, which is also running on the same machine, but it could run on the internet or whatever. Uh, and you can see here there's username and password, which are stored not in the configuration file, but in a secret file. Because many people uh, save the configuration in Git, on GitHub or somewhere, and then you just put your uh, secrets file uh, in Git Ignore and don't need to think about that you're pushing your passwords to, to GitHub. And then here also the lights, I use Yeelight and there's an integration for this. And I have a couple of devices which have their own IP addresses. So what I did is for every light bulb, I pin, pinned uh, the IP address to, to the light bulb in my router, so it doesn't change even even if if we switch it off or the power is gone on or something like that. And then I just gave them na names like bathroom or living room and so on. So let's see. Mm. Uh, my, I have a security cam at home, uh, mostly for testing, but it's also nice to, to be able to, to see if everything is still okay at home, because I'm, I'm traveling a lot uh, for, for longer periods and then I can just have a quick look. It's only on, on uh, so it only gets power when I'm at home, so that's basically the, the, the very, very first idea of mine was I would like something like a cam at home, but not. It should automatically switch, it off, switch itself off when I'm, when I'm uh, coming home. And it should automatically go on when I, I leave. For that I needed some kind of a system. And it turns out Home Assistant is really, really great for doing stuff like the, the automations like this. Uh, this particular one, uh, I, I have also tested many of them and I want also to use an open protocol, not some, something which just works with ActiveX in, a, in a, some old Internet Explorer. Uh, so it uses the OnViv protocol, so you can, you can use different apps for that. 
I can move it to left and right, up and down, and stuff like this. It has a nice MJPEG stream, which, uh, which I can directly uh, view in the browser or in the host, Home Assistant UI. You don't, again, want to have something special which, is, which only works in an ActiveX uh, thingy in some old data explorer, which still many of those do. And it does also movement detection, which sets me a notification on, on my phone. So I have those two states in my flat, and my present, which is done by my phone and uh, by Bluetooth. Uh, it does so I don't need to pair it, it just looks at the signature. Okay, is it somewhere in close or not? And then um, another state is, am I sleeping? And I, in, I, for a long time, I had to log into Home Assistant on my phone or, or my, on my laptop, and had to press the button. Okay, now I'm asleep, going to sleep, or now I wake, woke up. But uh, two weeks ago, I, I made a button for it, which sends a MQTT message so, to Home Assistant. On boot, when it boots up, it sends it, and that's it. So I just press the button, I go to sleep, and when I wake up. So that's the button. I, I have the Ethernet thingy just for comparison how little it can get. It's really, really nice and small. So that's also my first open source hardware, which I'm a bit proud of. <laughs> Because I'm, I'm not, not good at hardware stuff, but I, I still wanted to, both for me, is to understand how this all works, and also for me later to, to be able to go back and build something else out of it. So I wanted to document it nicely. Uh, so I, it's on GitHub, both the, the schematics and the software. It's GPNV3 and yeah. It consumes minim, hopefully minimal amount of energy because it only runs for like two seconds when you press the button, it boots, logs in into the Wi-Fi, sets the MQTT message and then shuts itself off. It has a really low lag for, for doing that, for the whole boot process and everything. So it's about one second from pressing the button until the lights go on or off. Uh, Let's just quickly look at the uh, source code. It's nothing special, basically. I use a couple of uh, libraries just to, to log in to the Wi-Fi. Uh, I do a couple of tests until it, it's connected. Then I connect to the MQTT server down there. Uh, and then I just send, publish the topic or the content and disconnect and then go to the ESP deep sleep for I think it's like 40 years or something uh, but obviously hopefully before that either the battery is run out or I press the button again uh, so. Then I have the kitchen temperature, which doesn't work right now, but uh, when I had a nice party weekend, I had it running and it showed a nice graph. So, so here, the first spike is on the Saturday uh, at like 10 o'clock where I started cleaning. And then people came about, uh, about 1 and it started to get hotter and hotter. Uh, and we parted through the night. And the, the last people went away at 12 o'clock in the morning, and then after that you can see that the temperature goes down, down, down. Which is fun, a fun graph. But the, 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 the whole electronics is basically the same as the button, but instead of a button I do have a, a thermometer. Uh, every thing, I, I have the prices here, so the ESP8266 was 24 crowns, the thermometer 17 crowns, and I had an old char USB charger to, to give it uh, 
power and it didn't cost anything. So it's if you if you if you want to, then it can can get really cheap. Uh, I still need to document this hardware, but uh, hopefully soon also. So, by, oh yeah, so this one doesn't use MQTT, I just uh, install, installed a HTTP server on it, and you can call it, so Homo Sitten calls it like regularly. First I had it once a minute, but now I have it once once an hour, and just it just uh, gives you back uh, the, the temperature as a floating point number. Yeah, we talked about the train alarm already. But a fun story was that I gave a, like I was in a telco where I was basically talking for one hour to like 100 people, and then it was in the morning and I was at home, uh, and then obviously a home assistant wanted me to go to the train. So three times during, uh, two times during that hour, it's a Gina. Let's go, the train is leaving, come on! And everybody, what? <laughs> uh, so, there are obviously different ways to trigger stuff. Uh, for example, I have here for, for trigger sleeping, I can do the button or the UI. But there's also something uh, built in, if you're using uh, Chrome, then, then you can use uh, Google's uh, Feeds to text to to trigger stuff like I did here. Uh, so it's already quite late, damn it. Um, so what you it's built in that you can uh, do like in, intentions and uh, intents. I mean, so basically. Uh, the intents can, can come from either speech, like with the browser, or other places. So I just, to, to test it, I did uh, like the three of them ten times, so I can ask it uh, what time is it, good night and good morning, basically. And then it, uh, it uh, then uh, either I trigger services here exactly like like I did with in the UI, but you can do everything you can do in the UI. You can also program directly in in a, in a YAML file, which I did here. So like the action is here, call the service, it put boolean on on the identity ID, sleeping for example. Uh, Home Assistant has, like over, you can see the one, uh, that was yesterday, 1048 uh, components. And a component is like, for example, Google Assistant or IKEA Throat Free, MQTT. So those are really different ones. And it's really alive. It has about 10, uh, 10 commits per day. I've, I looked at the, the last couple of weeks and it, it's about that. It has over 100 contributors, it's uh, Apache 2.0 license. They have a forum where you can ask questions and, and uh, a chat obviously also. Uh, I mostly go to the chat because I want to get answers fast. Then a couple of helper softwares. Software I use is like DuckDNS for for, for having uh, the dynamic IP connected to a, to a subdomain. Then I use uh, Let's Encrypt for HTTPS because it doesn't cost anything. And then uh, because I have other, uh, other cameras in other places, uh, I also use a software called Soulminder for motion detection there, where I only have like video stream from there. My future plans are uh, a motion detector, detector in the toilet because I don't have a window in the toilet and so I have just wanted to, to switch on the light during the night. Uh, I want to move to, to a nook because Soulminder is so heavy that, uh, that it needs more power and then I, I still only want one, one device. Uh, 
Then I started to look into voice recognition without the cloud via SNPs, but they only it's not open source and they only offer something for the Raspberry Pi, so it seems to be very difficult to do it to do voice recognition on your device and not somewhere in on Google servers or something. Uh, and then one thing which I also started preparing is uh, unlocking the front door when it detects that I'm close by. I found a nice uh, project who, where someone already did this and I al already have all the parts basically. I just need to in implement it now. And that's it. Uh, if you have questions then we still have uh, Four minutes. <laughs> yes, uh, I was thinking this is your train alarm. Uh, have you been thinking to kind of use some kind of uh, input from outside? For example, uh, if uh, trains are delayed or cancelled or something, yeah. that that information is also used in your. I was I was thinking about it and I checked the this like traffic market has an API and I looked at the API and I found that they have this information somehow but it's difficult to to map it to my train being late so it in theory it should work in practice it's very difficult okay thanks. One more. So yeah, uh, this uh, light automation is something I've been thinking about myself. But what I would want to have is something like when I go on vacation, mm -hmm. I wanted to light the uh, lights uh, as if I'm already home. Okay. Yeah. Is that something you can do with home system? Yeah, really easy. If you if you create your automations like we had it here. Uh, so for a trigger, basically you do the same what I did with the train alarm or with the clock, uh, the, the, the alarm clock during the morning. You trigger it by time or random or something, and then you just run the action uh, for like switch it on for that amount of time in this room, that amount of time in that room, and so on. Uh, yeah, um, it should be fairly easy. Um, since you've looked into this, um, how long do you think it will take until this infrastructure, for example, the uh, internet or connected uh, switches, and uh, mm -hmm. how long do you think this will take to come into our homes, but from the moment they build them, so you don't have, we don't have to hack our own house. Okay, so. yeah. I mean, we do have those here in the, uh, so if you go, if we look at this one, in Germany, uh, the, the, the telephone company Telekom already has like a Magenta smart house thingy, where well, they try to, to offer all this, all this basically in, in, in a nice package, but uh, it's so, I, I'm not sure if will, it will be that easy. Some of the, the low hanging fruits will be easy to, to do, like in a mass market, mass market thing. But a lot of things will be like so individual that it will be difficult to, because it's depending on, on, on how your flat looks like, or your house, and stuff like this, and what you want, what your family wants. It's so different that it's difficult to, to make a, 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 like, a, like a nice, package to just do but there all tenders has a couple of like uh, beginner packages with with a couple of switches and this central unit like this one here so you can so this can already be done fairly easy but most of the easy stuff is happening in the cloud basically if you're if you're okay with it then sure, go for it, but I don't want all my data to be at Google or Telus or wherever. That's why I built my stuff myself. 
Okay, I think it's I ooh, 59, so thank you very much.